I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In early February of this year, a group, a group of lawmakers in South Dakota tried to pass a bill to ban radical medical experimentation on young children. Under heavy pressure from business groups like the Chamber of Commerce, the Republican-dominated legislature voted it down. Why would they do that? Well, as you probably guessed by now, it's because conducting radical medical experiments on children is now popular. These experiments are justified in the name of transgenderism. The failed South Dakota bill would have barred doctors from performing sex reassignment surgery on children under the age of 16. Now, these are radical, often irreversible procedures that can include double mastectomies, sterilization, and castration. The bill would have also barred doctors from prescribing hormones to aid in the transition process. Once again, only for those under 16. Now, it used to be that everyone agreed with this idea. It was common sense. Adults are free to do essentially what they want. But if you're 15 or 9 or 10, you are too young to consent to profound acts, too young to consent to sex, too young to have your sex organs cut off. It's simple. This has been an operating understanding in the West for a thousand years. But the reticence to mutilate children, which was once now morally obvious, is now seen as bigoted. As the transgender movement has grown, activists have pushed to transition children at younger and younger ages. For children with gender dysphoria at a sufficiently young age, it has now become common to place children on drugs like Lupron, which suppress hormone production and thereby block the onset of puberty. At least one Democratic presidential candidate has endorsed providing these drugs, puberty blockers, at taxpayer expense. So the question is, are puberty blockers safe? And the answer is, we have no idea if they're safe. Lupron was initially developed to treat advanced prostate cancer in elderly men, a case in which severe or long-term side effects were not much of a concern. The drug has also been used to treat precocious puberty. That's a rare and harmful condition where children as young as five undergo premature hormonal changes. But what's the effect of blocking puberty, possibly for years, on children who don't have any underlying medical cause to do so? Well, we don't know the answer to that. Activists claim the drug's effect are fully reversible, but we don't know that that's true. Besides delaying physical maturity, Lupron also affects bone density. There are thousands, literally thousands, of young adults who took Lupron as children and now have to battle with bone and joint problems more common in the elderly. A few small studies also indicate that when used to arrest puberty, Lupron can lower a child's IQ, cognitive ability, by seven to nine points which is a lot. If that's really the case, it wouldn't be surprising, since puberty is crucial to completing the brain's development. And speaking of the brain, the rush to place children on puberty blockers is justified on the grounds of psychological health. Gender dysphoric kids who can't go on hormones right away, we are told, will likely become depressed or suicidal. Okay. But it turns out that depression is, in fact, a known side effect of puberty blockers. Irony of irony. In a recent study from the UK, after a year on puberty blockers, children were dramatically more likely to agree with the statement, quote, I deliberately tried to hurt or kill myself while they were taking the drugs. So far, there are zero long-term studies looking at the physical or mental effect of healthy children going on puberty blockers, whether they later go through a full sex change or not. Similarly, we know almost nothing about the long-term prognosis for children who undergo full physical transitions. It's simply too new. We don't know. We do have studies, though, on what happens to gender dysphoric children who don't receive puberty blockers. In about 80 percent of those cases, boys who wish they were girls or girls who wish they were boys eventually get over it and turn out fine, with no radical treatments necessary. As adults, many of these children become gay or bisexual, but they still identify with their biological sex, and they do not want sex change surgery. Think about that. 
That means that most, if not all, children with gender dysphoria should wait until adulthood to transition. Otherwise, the vast majority of them will get expensive, invasive, potentially dangerous, possibly irreversible treatments they never needed and, in the end, wouldn't have wanted anyway. But activists can't wait for adulthood. They want any children with gender dysphoria to be pushed into a full transition as quickly as possible. In other words, they want doctors to carry out a vast human experiment with this nation's children, your children, as its subjects. And it really is a vast experiment. In 2009, the UK's Gender Identity Development Service, or GIDS, received 77 referrals for child gender dysphoria. A decade later, they received almost 2,600. That's an increase of more than 3,000 percent. Notably, while a decade ago most gender dysphoric children were biologically male, today a majority are biologically female. So why is that? Seems worth finding out. And despite the professional risks, some have tried to do so. In 2018, Brown University researcher Lisa Littman found that many teenage girls are abruptly identifying as transgender after seeing a friend do so or after being exposed to pro-trans material online. And there's an awful lot of that. In other words, impressionable teen girls may literally be taking part in a fad, a fad that involves irreversible surgery at the end of it. Here's a terrifying quote from The Times of London, a mainstream British newspaper, and we're quoting here. 35 GIDS clinicians have resigned in the past three years, many alarmed by the rush to medicalization and the way Instagram trans influencers and the CBBC program I Am Leo present transition as uncomplicated. They say they are seeing girls with a panoply of other issues, anxiety, depression, self-harm, undiagnosed autism, victims of homophobic bullying and sexual abuse, for whom transition to a male body was presented online as the universal panacea. Often a normal tomboyish disgust at their new breasts, eliciting sudden and unwanted sexual attention from men, is interpreted as a certainty that they are in the wrong body. Yet, if instead, instead of interrogating these underlying issues, clinicians are told to affirm a young person's trans identity and prescribe puberty blockers that trans campaigners fiercely insist are their right, unquote. Think about it. That's horrifying. That's not medicine. It's something else. At this moment, 19 U.S. states ban so-called conversion therapy for minors. That's a therapy that claims it's possible for gay people to become heterosexual. Now, the states have banned it, even though it involves no surgery, no medication, no physical treatments, on the grounds that it doesn't work and it could drive gay teenagers into depression or suicide. In effect, and this is the key, those states have said that if you want to provide a risky elective therapy with no proof it'll work, you have to wait until a child has become an adult. That makes sense. Similarly, many states ban minors from getting tattoos for the same reason. They're permanent, and they can change your life forever. So kids ought to wait till adulthood before they make that choice. This used to be obvious, once again. But on the far more radical treatments used for transgenderism, states are doing nothing at all. Being transgender is at odds with science and God's design, as we read in Genesis 126 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Somehow, in some mysterious and wonderful way, the human male and female, in both body and spirit, are the image and likeness of God. Satan hates mankind because we are created in God's image. He is sowing confusion in the minds of our children, and he is busy in these last days devouring those who are not steadfast in the faith, as we read in 1 Peter 5, 8-11. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, 
The pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. We want to get right to the latest on the coronavirus emergency. The virus is continuing to spread overnight. More than 600 new cases reported, bringing the worldwide total to more than 83,000. It is now in 54 countries. Major events in Asia and Europe either canceled or closed to the public in an effort to stem this spread. And here in the U.S., a lot of focus is being put this morning in Northern California, where officials are trying to figure out how a woman contracted the virus with no known exposure to it. That's a big deal. Also explosive allegations from a whistleblower this morning claiming more than a dozen people sent to receive the first Americans returning from Wuhan did not have proper training or protective gear. And all this has rocked financial markets around the world. The worst sell-off on Wall Street since the financial crisis in 2008. Growing fears the virus could tip economies into recession. So we want to begin with Rebecca Jarvis at the New York Stock Exchange. Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning, George. We are looking at another day of extreme volatility. Stocks opened just moments ago with the Dow down more than 600 points. And this week alone, stocks have now wiped out nearly three and a half trillion dollars in value. This morning, stocks in the midst of their worst week since the financial crisis. The Dow plunging more than 3,200 points in just four days. After hitting record highs just last week, stocks are now down nearly 11% meaning the typical 401k, which ended last year over $112,000, dropped by more than $12,000 in just the last few days. Goldman Sachs predicting that the biggest companies in the U.S. may not grow at all this year because of the coronavirus. The ripple effects across many industries. Companies that rely on travel like Marriott and United Airlines warning the outbreak will negatively affect their business, while others like Nike and Apple say factories shuttered in China have delayed production. Facebook canceling a major conference and America's largest private company, Cargill, joining a growing list of firms banning travel for employees. And Wall Street is trying to answer the same question as all of us. How severe and how long lasting will this coronavirus and its effects be? And not having an answer can produce the same economic consequences as having an answer that's bad. There is a ripple effect here, and that is what you're seeing reflected in both the stock market and eventually in the real economy. James 5, 1 through 6. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sebaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. New Chicago crime numbers for February are out this morning and murders and shootings, they are up. The city had 34 murders last month. That's 10 more murders than we had in February of last year. A 41% increase. 166 people were shot compared to 123 this same time last year. Carjackings are up, especially on the city's north side. And police are bringing back a carjacking task force to try to turn that trend around. Hail of gunfire in Baldwin Village. 
We know at least three people, including a child, injured in separate shootings. This happening just blocks away from each other. CBS 2's Jeff Nguyen live outside LAPD Southwest Community Police Station with what officers are saying about this. Jeff? Sarah and Chris, detectives here are working on both of these cases tonight. And one of the victims is an innocent child who was just simply out for an evening stroll. Yellow police tape roped off the 4100 block of Somerset Drive in Baldwin Village following a shooting, an attack that happened right outside Renata Wilkins' home. She asked us not to show her face. And I heard um, the shoot, the, the gunshots. Police say a man in his 30s had been walking here with a woman while carrying a six-year-old boy around 5 p.m. That's when another man walked up and shot the male victim and the child. The shooter ran off on foot. I saw blood on the back of a shirt, and then I heard him scream, oh, my God, my baby's been shot. Whenever a child is struck that was just innocent, has nothing to do with, with whatever altercation was taking place, it's uh, very disheartening. About two hours later, a second shooting happened nearby at Jim Gilliam Recreation Center where one person was hit. It's unclear if it's related to the Somerset shooting, which is believed to be gang related. And Renata Wilkins says no matter the motive for the shooting, an innocent child should not have been dragged into it. I just kind of just lost it seeing a baby with all the blood. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. A 48 hours investigation uncovers disturbing new details in the murder for hire case of a Minnesota teenager. For more than two years, Peter Van Zandt has been on a journey through the dark web investigating websites that advertise hitmen for hire. His 2018 report, Click for a Killer, exposed about 20 active murder plots. He's here now with the stunning results of an all-new 48 Hours global investigation. I'm no different than any other teenager in America. In July 2018, teenager Alexa Stern was driving near her home in Big Lake, Minnesota, when she got a shocking call from police. Someone wanted her dead. I was like... This is a joke, right? It wasn't a joke. Authorities told her that a person codenamed Mastermind365 had gone to a murder for hire website on the dark web to have her killed. The site was run by a shadowy figure who calls himself Yura. He sent us some videos. You can submit your orders to kill the people you hate. Looking for criminals on the dark web like Yura is not for the faint of heart. We hired this dark web intelligence analyst, who we called Lisa, to begin a worldwide search to find Europe. Alexis believes her ex-boyfriend, Adrian Fry, an English video gamer, paid Yura for her murder. Alexis says Adrian visited her three times in Minnesota and was deeply in love. He was already pretty much talking about getting married, honestly. She broke it off and says he was angry pretty much saying you deserve everything horrible that happens to you. Adrian has denied he tried to hire a hitman. Our dark web investigation has taken us from England to Moldova in Eastern Europe, as well as India, and eventually back to the US. Our analyst Lisa found a dark web password, among other clues, that could link Yura to a family in Queens, New York. There's a door opening, something's about to come out. Yeah, I'm gonna drop my head down. My heart is racing. It all leads to a dramatic confrontation. <gasps> Ooh. Whoa. Peter, what just happened? Uh, my photographer got smacked on the side of the head. Uh, we had confronted a person that our dark web expert believes is linked uh, to this murder for hire site and possibly Yura himself. 
We met on a public street, and I asked some very pointed questions. And you have to watch this show to see how yeah. the course of that conversation went on. And, and I couldn't see uh, that coming. Was, Is the photographer okay? What? He, the photographer is okay. Uh, he, he his forehead was cut, mm. and uh, we left shortly thereafter. Uh, wow! And it was it's fascinating to watch this back and forth with this with this person. It's very scary stuff, Peter. It is. Turning now to some horrifying moments inside a Colorado home, and they were all captured on police body camera. A suspect keeping four people inside, including children. Officers moving in. Clayton Sandell has more on the dramatic images. We're not playing any games, man. We just want to make sure everybody's safe. We are. Okay. Tonight, new video shows police in Greeley, Colorado, in a dangerous standoff. He has a gun in his hand. An armed man in this house refuses to come out. Three kids and one woman are inside with him, but he won't let them leave. Can you mark here with me a little bit, man? Can you just show me your hands? Dad. Can you talk to me about what's bugging you today? Yeah. Okay, okay. That's a place to be in, man. No judgment. Don't try it, man. I'm not trying anything. I'm just trying to talk to you, that's all. A crisis negotiator tries to talk him out as a SWAT team surrounds the house. That's when officers see kids in an upstairs window. There's one right here. Is it correct? No, somebody's waving at us. Open your window. They scramble to find a way to reach them. Hey, hey, kids. C can you push the screen out? You gotta have a ladder. We got a ladder? Oh. Help me. One officer quietly climbs to the kid's bedroom. Just try to get him down. Okay, you guys start getting ready to go. Training his gun on the bedroom door while the kids climb to safety. Okay, be careful. I got you, okay? I got you. And Lindsay, after that rescue, police were able to convince the man to release the other child and the woman that were in that house. They say he then shot himself. He did not survive. Police say this all began when the man violated a restraining order. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5-13. through Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24, verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. These aerial pictures released by the Turkish army purport to show Syrian government targets being pummeled in Idlib province. 
President Erdogan's office says that all known Assad targets have come and will continue to come under fire from the air and from the ground. The retaliatory strikes come after the deadliest day for Turkish soldiers in this northwestern pocket of Syria since Ankara first put boots on the ground four years ago. Erdogan chaired an emergency security meeting late on Thursday to discuss the situation, just hours after Turkey and Russia wrapped up two days of talks. We've been talking with our Russian counterparts about the activities of our air force in Idlib, including armed drones and unarmed drones, because it's vital for the ceasefire to continue and to monitor what's going on. As tensions mount between Turkey and Syria and its Russian allies, far away in New York, the Western members of the UN Security Council have called for an immediate halt to hostilities, with France and UNICEF united in their condemnation of attacks on hospitals, schools and refugee camps. Tens of thousands are now living in makeshift tents in public buildings, in open air, huddled under trees exposed to rain and snow and sub-zero cold of the harsh Syrian winter. With more of its soldiers killed on Syrian soil and with a growing number of refugees knocking at its door, one senior Turkish official says Ankara will no longer stop Syrian refugees from reaching Europe, with Coast Guard and border security officials ordered to stand down at land and sea crossings. We know that those drones are unmanned and that they are armed and that they are the newest uh, weapon of the Turkish army that has been doing a, a very a thorough job in the last few days. And in fact, uh, this Sunday, another uh, Turkish drone uh, was actually shot down uh, by Syrian uh, regime forces, as according to uh, the official uh, Syrian news agency, Sana. Uh, now, that, uh, that uh, shooting down of that drone was in retaliation uh, for the shooting down of a Syrian plane uh, earlier uh, on Sunday this morning. And in, uh, in, uh, as a result of those, uh, of those events, uh, the Syrian government has shut down the airspace in all of uh, northwestern Syria, including uh, over the uh, province uh, of Idlib. Now, uh, the Turkish presence in Syria uh, ha finally has a name. It's Operation uh, Spring Shields that officially began uh, four days ago uh, after the attack on a convoy of Turkish soldiers uh, that officially killed 36 of them. Uh, and so this, uh, this, uh, uh, this operation uh, that was announced by the defense minister uh, is uh, it, apparently not uh, to uh, provoke a direct confrontation uh, with Russia, but uh, Hulusi Akar says uh, that uh, in fact it is uh, more to prevent further massacres by the Syrian uh, government regime uh, as well as to uh, stop radicalization and most importantly uh, to stop the flow of refugees uh, out of Syria. Luke 21:25, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Now to India, where the death toll continues to climb amid clashes between Hindus and Muslims over a new citizenship law. This week, New Delhi has seen its worst violence in decades, with at least 34 people killed in those clashes. The controversial law excludes Muslims from amnesty for migrants who entered illegally from some neighboring Muslim-majority countries. Its introduction has led to mass demonstrations, with protesters saying it discriminates against Muslims. Muslim immigrants. India's army has been called in to intervene as the country's prime minister asked for peace. The riots coincided with President Trump's trip to India, something he called progressive. And finally to Greece, where violent strikes over the building of new migrant centers have entered their second day. Police were seen firing tear gas as hundreds of protesters threw stones at officers and blocked roads to those construction sites. The protests are in response to government plans to replace overcrowded facilities for the thousands of migrants, particularly Syrian migrants, that migrate through the Greek islands each year. Locals on some islands have organized protests, saying they're concerned the new centers will become permanent and encourage the migrants to stay. Now, overnight, at least 52 riot police officers and 10 protesters were injured. In one instance, people broke into hotel rooms where officers were staying and began to beat them up.
After the rain, there's a sense of quiet resignation to work together to clean up the streets. The flood water is a frequent unwelcome presence in their homes. These family members are wearing clothes borrowed from relatives. Their television isn't working, their furniture destroyed, and their bedding and clothes are ruined. We are traumatized. It has happened so many times just this month. Our things are ruined. The water came in so fast. We didn't have time to save them. Jakarta's local governor is being criticized over how his administration has handled this year's floods. Advisers to the national government say there was a lack of preparation. What has happened in the January floods was such massive destruction. We have early warning systems to plan ahead. For example, they should have dedicated land for people to leave their cars so fewer vehicles could have been damaged. Lawyer Azas Tigor Nangolan is leading a class action on behalf of those affected by floods in January when 66 people were killed in flash flooding. He says more people may join the class action as the floods continue. There is no early warning system. We have the rainy season all the time. There should be more preparation, but nothing has changed. Governor Anis Baswedan says the city is adequately prepared for the rainy season and has been monitoring and clearing gutters on homes and buildings as a precaution. But many say that's not enough. This is now a familiar routine for people here, self-evacuating and then coming back to assess the damage and at least try to clean up. This area has been flooded at least five times this month and there's more extreme weather coming. Hundreds have sought shelter at a local mosque after torrential rain. Some have begun to return home, but it won't be long before they may need to leave again. More heavy rain and storms are forecast until the beginning of next month. We begin this morning with actually a bit of good news, something rescue crews in Colombia are calling a miracle. After a deadly mudslide swept through the country's northeast region, volunteers and rescue teams urgently searched for any survivors. That's when they found this nine-month-old baby boy alive among the, de the mud and devastation. The baby, along with two other people, were rescued from the rural area and taken to a nearby hospital. Now, sadly, five people have died from this week's mudslides and at least a dozen remain missing. Heavy rain has been blamed for the tragedy. Jesus declares this in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, he is returning. One of the things that parallel our days with the days of Noah is the unprecedented flooding the world has been experiencing over the last few years. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, things will be going on as normal as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.